Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast here with John. John, please, for everyone out there listening, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm John Callis. I am Director of Technology Projects at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, I'm also a cryptographer and have started up businesses on that. I'm one of the co-founders of PGP. I also worked on a one of the founders of Black Phone, which was a privacy enhanced Android phone. Um, Silent Circle, which was a end to end secure voice video texting system. I've also worked for Apple and a number of other places. Do you have a lot of people that want like a private secure connection when it comes to like their private stuff, like emails, texts? I mean, is that a, is, was that, was that app or whatever you developed? Is that something that really, really took off? Was it with a niche market or was it with like the, the general audience? That's the first time I've ever heard of it. And I mean, I know people that use Proton Mail, they use all these types of things because they don't really trust Google as much. And it seems like a lot more people are conscious of their privacy when it comes to their information that they're sending across to people but also there is a giant gap in information on what issues or ethics i would say when it comes to data privacy yeah i mean personally there are a lot of people who care very deeply about their privacy but not so much that they should do something about it and and it's it's easy to complain and it's hard to do things um it's there are a lot of victories that we have been making on this very slowly. For example, about 10 years ago, my team at EFF got the idea of why don't we just encrypt everything on the web? And that led to a browser thing we made called HTTPS Everywhere. It led to EFF working with Let's Encrypt to make it so that there were SSL certificates people could get for free. We make a thing you can run on Unix or Windows called CertBot that will automatically update things. Because part of the problem, for example, was how do you update these things? And the software that existed was really horrible. You had to go manually change things, even the people who you would get your certificates from wouldn't remind you before they expired. And so CertBot goes out and updates regularly all of your things. It, it ships on most Linux distributions. You turn it on, you forget it, and you don't have to think about it anymore. And that's been a huge benefit. Now, over 95% of all web traffic not websites, web traffic. There are many sites that are still not encrypted. And there's even been the XKCD joke that is like, you know, this thing is unencrypted, but it hasn't changed since 2015. So it's probably okay. <laughs> that, well, so, well, for the general audience, like encryption, for instance, what's the importance of encryption? I know that makes your, I guess, connection secure in a way, but I'm, I'm having concerns just on the concept of I'm getting so many spam calls where people know my name and I've never given out my information, especially on like a rental home site or something like that. But they're calling me and I'm like, can you take me off your list? Yep, we'll do that in 24 hours. I've gotten eight since they said they were going to take me off in 24 hours. And it's been longer than 24 hours where I start going, is there some of my information that's on my profile that's somehow being leaked into other aspects of things? I mean, I go onto a lot of websites and stuff. This computer is strictly for like recording and stuff. But if I access my email, I started noticing like a lot of people sending me Proton emails, like very controversial figures I've had on the show. And then some of my emails ever since I've had certain ones on have been getting lost, have not been sending properly. My email keeps saying change your password all the time. It seems like it's getting 
accessible to other outside sources? There are both things that are going on and you're suffering from the Mandela effect. That, that, you know, this is that once you decide that something is important, all of a sudden you see it everywhere. And, and everybody does this. So, you know, you talk to people about privacy and then you start noticing all of the things that you were forgetting. One of the things that our brains does is that we are constantly processing so much information from all of our senses that we do a form of lossy compression in our heads where our brains and our nervous systems filter out things that are not important. And when you become inured to something like, you know, there's a background hum and, and you stop noticing it, your nerves even stop firing. You know, you are literally not perceiving it because your nervous system has essentially cut it out. Um, our, our vision is really only detailed and in color in the center of what we're looking at. The rest of what we look at is not that, and our brains put this in. They even do things like, do you ever remember that when you blink, there's going to be a little black spot in your vision? No, our brains edit out our blinks. And then once you say, oh my God, my brain is editing out my blinks, you'll probably start seeing every blink you do for the next five minutes. And that that's the essence of what we're talking about. So there are lots of privacy problems. There's also a tendency that we have to assemble things in time and think that they're causal when there's something else that's going on. So you have a podcast, you're therefore really easy to figure out. You probably put your phone number somewhere. Um, you know, it's like, I decided a long time ago that I was just going to use my cell phone. As you note, it's got my cell phone number in the footer of every email I send. So finding my cell phone number is not that hard. And you probably put something sometime with a contact phone number and somebody either rightly or wrongly, and there are, there's plenty of wrongly that we know. Like for example, Twitter got in a lot of hot water recently because they got people to put in their phone number for account recovery purposes and then handed it on to the marketing people. And that's something that, that FTC is bugging them and they're getting a lot of heat for it, but your phone number got out. And a lot of the identifiers that we have are what I would call hard identifiers or sticky identifiers because they're hard to change. You know, there, there, there's a joke that the first three digits of your phone number, the area code are where you lived when you were old enough to pay your first phone bill on your own. And there's a certain, you know, there's a good deal of truth to that because we get a phone number, we don't get rid of it. Um, so that becomes something that is very easy to track someone by. And in a lot of countries, that sort of identifier is an even stickier identifier because you had to show real world ID to get it. Um, it's certainly true in a lot of repressive countries, but it's even true in civilized countries like Germany and Norway. If you go to Germany and you want to get a SIM card for your cell phone, you have to show your passport. So they know who you were. They know who this phone number is associated with. And, and if you put that as contact information and somebody sells it in a data set, then um, it's out there. And a lot of also what goes on with a lot of these robocalls is that they are in fact, essentially just calling everybody. I mean, the reason that you're getting called is in fact that they call everybody. And there is a sneaky robot that implies that it knows information that it doesn't. And that's, that's just how they work. They 
similar to mass marketing, make a lot of phone calls. They expect to get between like one in a hundred to one in a thousand responses. And if you make a million phone calls and one of a thousand of them works, well, that's a thousand phone calls that worked. See, my area with putting up private information like that, especially if we talk about Twitter, even Apple, for instance, my issues, I have giant concerns with Apple, not just the fact of like, oh my God, they're tracking me, which I mean, I definitely think about it a little bit, but I'm not super worried about it. It's where I'm like staring out my window, looking for helicopters or anything, because I'm not doing anything insane. And I know that's the argument people use is, well, what are you doing that you're afraid to be tracked? No, what I'm afraid of is that my card information is on my Apple account. And recently I had my account locked. Um, my whole credit card, everything was locked. I couldn't make any transactions. And I got a call saying that there was a bunch of $1 charges. And I think this is the area of concern, especially if we look at Apple, for instance, more people in the US have Apple, probably have an iPhone or some sort of that thing. I, I know some people have Android, some people have that, but uh, more commonly, you'll probably have someone with an iPhone and Apple is constantly updating their security because of the breaches that people are trying to do, whether it's overseas or whatever you want to talk about. This is the area I got into with the app Pegasus and all these types of weird spyware that are going on out there. Now, I don't think I'm being tracked by Pegasus or anything of that sort, but I do talk about the fact is, I mean, how many breaches are they trying to recover from or trying to fix? I mean, if everyone's looking at Apple as the top dog, we got to find a way into there because they have the most information on people. Then they got to constantly keep updating their phones and making sure that they're secure is up to date, it brings into an area of concern when people's private information is on there, where I start wondering, what's the ethical choice there? What's the decision? Where, where do we go? Should we just, should companies like that have our cards on file? And a lot of times it is a priority, or is it something you have to do to get your account filed with? They need to have a card on file for some reason. I can't just put in a random thing. I can't put in nothing. They need a card on file. There's good and bad things going on here. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that when we were doing Silent Circle, we wanted to make it so that we decided that we were going to have a paid service rather than a free one. And we also wanted to make it so that people could pay for it with reasonably anonymous things. So we kept, we kept a base set of charges so that you could go get like a MasterCard, American Express gift card and pay for a year's worth of service with one of those. But there are all sorts of things that you want to do where you, what you really want is that you want to buy this thing regularly. You know, you want to be, you want to get that magazine every month, you want a month's service from this, and that's what they need the card on file for. If they don't have that, there's no good way to do the billing. Or they would they would annoy you with things where you would have to approve them. And one can argue from a financial aspect that if you are being charged automatically and you have to take a decision to stop the charge, you are less likely to do things and stop doing something than if you had to approve it every time. It's like another one of the strange things that goes on in our brains is how defaults work. There's been a lot of studies over this. Like, for example, if you think of like the little organ donor thing on your driver's license, if you have the default be that you're not an organ donor and you tick a little box to say, I want to be one, about 20% of people will sign up. And if you have it be by default, you're an organ donor and you tick a box to not be one, about 80% of people do. And this is one of those psychological things that recurring payments are both really convenient and they make it highly more likely for things for you to pay for things to feel eh about. Uh, you know, for example, I I back a lot of people on Patreon. There's a lot of artists and writers and other people that I back on Patreon. 
And I relatively rarely go through them and say, do I really care about this that much anymore? Um, you know, there's, I started subscribing to um, a, a magazine that is about literary things in the midst of the Trump administration. And now here it is, and I know that I'm reading it less, but do I want to cancel the subscription? And because they bill me for the subscription every, every three months, I have to make the decision to cancel. Whereas if I had to make the decision to approve it, then I would probably say, yeah, maybe not. So this is part of the dynamic is how these things play with our heads and what they use to play with our heads to do that. So is the conflict between people taking this device or this tool that they use in their phone and all the apps that they use and the web services or the subscriptions that they can do as they're looking at it more with like personal, like it's more personal to them, but really it's from a business standpoint. Cause the way you just explained that to me, I was like, that's just smart business. That's really smart business. You don't want people to deny or if they're going to have to verify and you know that more people are going to say no, rather than if you just bill them because their cards on file, you're automatically going to get the money and there's not really a chance of someone probably going into their account and removing that. I mean, so it, it's a conflict of business and personal. So, I mean, how do, uh, it, so how do we, how do we fix that? Like, I, I'm not saying maybe, maybe even should we, I just think it brings in really crazy scenarios when we allow, I guess, the lack of information when it comes to our devices or the things that we use. I mean, I had a guest on here who studies ethical concerns when it comes to biomedicine and she was bringing up the app, uh, the idea that these apps, um, period trackers, for instance, that's something that you need a consent form for something medical, anything medical should be a consent form. And these things you can get by just accepting terms and service. But what they don't tell you is that in these things they do on a polling ship, if they're going to test if an app's effective, they won't use your name, but they'll use the data that they consumed off of a, a, a medical app like this and they'll send it somewhere and i just go holy shit like that's i that's scary to me i mean i get it because you have to read the terms and services but that's also a thing psychologically people are lazy and they don't want to read the terms and services necessarily because they're trying to get to the end product i don't know how many things say except cookies and data and i just click i always hit reject but i know some people just click to accept to get onto the page yeah um I'll, I'll be more cranky about terms and services because there are so many terms and services around. Somebody estimated that if you spent, if you read all of the terms and services that you were presented with, you'd spend like two months every year just reading that, terms and services. That's a lot. And, and I think that from a legal standpoint, this is an issue because anything that is a contract requires a certain amount of informed consent and and one could argue that this is a real issue. Um, and there's another one of these related things, which is that many of the things that we're using, we're being offered them for free. And what's really happening is you're paying for this thing with your data. And the terms and services are them describing how they are going to use their data. And usually it boils down to however they want. In, in a number of cases, there are perfectly well-meaning companies that are doing things. And if something happens like they go broke and the remnants of the company get bought, if that company is bought by somebody who wants to monetize the data or they bought it because what they wanted was the data, then they buy that up in the bankruptcy and now they've got all of the data and suddenly your terms and services no longer apply. And that is an issue that lots of us want to fix is, is that that would do things, that that would not be an asset that could be transferred. Now, the downside of this is going to be, of course, that you will get free services. There's huge complexity here that we use things all the time that we don't pay for, or we're paying for them with our information. You know, 
Do you use social media? Do you do you use a free plan on something? Well, they're they're running their business. They're keeping the electricity going. They're paying people who also have food they want to buy and rent they want to pay for and so on. And they're doing that by selling the data. So what are you really going to do with that? And there is an upside that an awful lot of our services are available to people no matter what their income is. It doesn't matter how much you make. It doesn't matter whether or not you are on any sort of job from being a clerk or someone who doesn't have one to Elon Musk, you can use Twitter for free. And that is a nice thing that we are separating it from having to be a payment. Um, we at EFF want to say that privacy should not be a luxury good. On the other hand, free services are paid for with information. And these are in tension with each other. They are both true at the same time. And if it, it, it is really true that if you're not paying for it, you are the product, you're not the customer. But it's also true that if you don't think that it is worth paying for, or your budget only allows you a certain amount, that you get an awful lot of services that are the exact same that everybody else is getting for. And the only thing you're paying for it is some information. You know, you're getting some ads targeted to you and other things. So both of these things are true at the same time. And that's where it is hard to unpack a lot of this, that if we go to a world where we pay for privacy, people who don't have money will be left behind. Tying this back into some of the things that you're talking about, I used to run my own mail servers, and I also used to run encryption servers on them. Um, at PGP, we had a thing called PGP Universal, which would encrypt all of your email. Everything that you did would end up being encrypted, similarly to the sorts of things that, say, Proton Mail is it, it does with their service. And I'm not going to go into the details because it doesn't matter. I finally got to the point that I stopped wanting to run my own emails just because I was tired of it. it the third or fourth time that that thing that you wanted to do on Sunday is derailed because you need to be a site reliability engineer for your parents, the more that you think, hmm, maybe I don't want to do this anymore. And I gradually migrated us off. And I have mylastname.org and my partner's lastname.org, and I run email and other things for my parents and her family as well. So I moved them all to Google. And there was also some, I didn't, there were things that I didn't like, and I'm not going to say, oh, I used this service and didn't like them because that's not fair. I ended up eventually moving it over to Google and I set us up as a company. So I pay $7 a month to Google. And if I pay $7 a month to Google, Google doesn't monetize my data. So if you look at it, you have these two choices and they're there today with say Gmail. You can get it for free and they're monetizing your data. You can pay for it and they're not. Well, okay, so now we're at the point where privacy is a luxury good because what we're getting is that the less expensive and free stuff has less privacy on it. A couple of years ago, the president of the television company Vizio said at Consumer Electronics Show that they, in fact, monetize your data about what shows you watch and so on and so forth. And that's why they can sell their TVs so cheap. So if you are getting, say, you know, a 20% discount, you know, 100 bucks on a $500 TV, if you're getting that for them monetizing your data, is it worth it or not? 
I know a lot of people for whom it's not. And the alternative is rather expensive because you've got to go buy a monitor, not a TV. And we're back to this unfortunate equation, which is that we're getting things for free or discounted based upon them using our data. So there's kind of the broad aspect of it. Um, I, I think I agree with you, like paying for it. I definitely think that, you know, you're, if they give you the right to keep your stuff private and not sell your data, I'm just curious, what, what are the extents of data though? What extensive information are they pulling out from you that you're using if you're using it for free? Cause then we could take the extreme scenario where you have people getting their medical information out there and that's very, very private. But also if we take another extreme scenario, Alexa being used in a court case because it's constantly recording. I mean, I think everyone knows that they're constantly recording, but that also is like a, it, it keeps getting weirder and we become more normalized to it. Mm -hmm. They're constantly listening, not necessarily recording. That's still nuts though. <laughs> well, do you really want a voice assistant then? I don't have one. That's what I'm saying though, is what th there is that there's those cases. People have these luxuries or these things that are involved into their life and necessarily they don't know the full extent of what it is because they don't need to include that on the packaging. They don't need to include that on the details or the description of anything. It's just kind of like, wait, what this is happening. I mean, Google, Facebook, and all these things were just uh, a couple months ago. They were in some really deep water on some stuff. I mean, there's, Issues? They're in deep water enough that I don't even know which one you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's like the, the you know the the deep water of the month. Well, it's like when I talk to people who are in cybersecurity or data privacy or work for companies, they have a whole host of information that's more normalized to them because they're aware of it. But the general public isn't aware of a lot of the issues that are going on when it does come to their private data information. I mean, how far does the extent with data protection or data privacy really go? I mean, is it as simple as like, oh, you're just going to sell my browsing history for advertisers? Or are you going to start selling my personal information and things I filled out on forms that necessarily weren't on your website? I started noticing this when I was going to different websites and I would hit accept uh, cookies and data on one website. And then I didn't have to do it on the other one. I was like, why didn't I have to do it on this one? And you realize, oh, crap, like they're the because same. Because they're you. Right. They're using the same back end. Um, yeah. Um, and there are lots of ways that you can do things. I mean, you know, for example, we make a, a extension for Chrome at, and Chrome like things like Vivaldi. I use Vivaldi myself a lot and, um, Firefox, we, we have, it's called privacy badger and it removes tracking cookies and it removes trackers from what you're doing. So all that it does is it removes the things that track you. I also run a bunch of ad blockers and yeah, there are a lot of times I go to a news site and it says, oh my God, you're using an ad blocker. And we're coming up smack against this dichotomy, which is that we have an entire economy that is based around advertisements subsidizing the cost of things. In in the bad old days, when we got a lot of our things on paper, it was typical in the United States that advertisements paid for about 80% of the cost of a magazine or a newspaper. And in Europe, it was the other way around. They paid for about 20% of it. So it meant that when you went to Europe or you got a European magazine, it would be more expensive. So, you know, a, a, a copy of um, Trouser Press would cost more than a copy of Rolling Stone, even though they were both giving you movie reviews because of how much the advertisements were paying for the cost of the whole thing. That model has moved into the internet because people have built things that we like. And I'm using the word like in a special sense because you know, if you say, I hate Facebook, but I can't get off of it, I'm going to sit back in my chair and smirk a bit and say, no, actually you like it. Because if you hated it, you'd stop using it. And, you know, and, and part of the reason for my smile is I understand the problems in what I'm saying, I'm just making a point. So 
we're using things that we're paying for with our data. There is an entire business of very, very, very smart people who are putting that together to figure out what to do. And it is both scary and appalling. And one of the things that is also appalling is how bad it is. I mean, come on. It's like, how often do you get an ad for something before you buy it? Well, YouTube used to be you could skip an ad, then they don't let you skip it. But now they just give you two ads. And it's like if you're you know, listening to music in your car and you don't want to pick up your phone to sw- skip the ad thing, they last like 10 minutes long. And it's like, Jesus, like and I get it because you're using the service and it's free. So this is how they're going to get their money and stuff like that. But it's been an encroachment. It's been a fear for people in virtual reality who work in that field. They talk about like the beginning is going to be amazing when virtual reality becomes more normal. You'll be in an educational class online. But their fear is, is that after enough time, it'll start being marketed in a sense where you'll be in the middle of class learning about Christopher Columbus or whatever, and you'll get an advertisement. And like we already have kids that are accepting cookies and walking right into things all because they want to play Fortnite or a game. But they're also very, very manipulated by advertisements, much like we are, but maybe at a worse scale because they might be on their device more. Now, I've accepted one thing, and that is I don't. On my social media, I put up one post and I'm gone. That's it. I don't put up Facebook posts. I don't put up Instagram posts. I just do one post for the episode of the show and that's it. That's on my personal as well too. Only because I started noticing like people were like, complaining about their day talking about like hey just a quick question anybody try this pharmaceutical drug for depression is this a good one to use and i'm like you're leaving a log you are literally giving all your information out to the open not just the general public but anybody that just wants to search you up on facebook and they see that there and i noticed that and i got concerned and i got scared and i go jesus how many people are tweeting about a food that they're eating? You will know where everybody's at just on the basis of their tweets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fear. That's a scare. Um, yeah. And, and you are using social media as a work thing. Um, I also use it as a work thing. I mean, you know, EFF has has a Twitter account. We have Facebook. We have a TikTok. We have these other things because that's how we get our messages out. And and this is what we are all doing is that we are using these media to talk to other people and they have a certain set of knock on effects. And that includes that there is an entire economy that we don't know about, about people who are buying and selling information and what goes on with it. So I want to try to unpack some of this and rewind some things, because part of what you were talking about is the fears of stuff, like, for example, presently post the Dobbs decision, uh, there's been the delete your period tracker meme, which we've been saying that's probably not, you know, maybe you should review it, but that's probably not what you need to worry about. Um, For example, right now we have license plate readers everywhere. There's lots of places where you go through an intersection, you go into a neighborhood, a license plate reader does things back and forth. Uh, I'm in the Bay Area of California. All of the bridges that we have have moved to new to no tool booth, no toll booth, and and they you either have one of these transponders in your car, and they have them all over the country that will bill you automatically, or they have license plate readers, and they use license plate readers for enforcement as well, because if you are cheating and getting into, you know, going on the bridge and don't want to pay for it, they'll send you the bill. Um, I was last fall visiting my parents on the East Coast, and I borrowed their car and went to my in-laws, and It was very interesting to see what all happened. The state of Maryland, right before pandemic, shut down all toll booths with people in them. They went totally to either Easy Pass or built a license plate. I live in Maryland, I know. Yeah. Um, You know, here in California, they can either build to 
the easy pass or I went to their website and they and they said, oh, you could sign up for build by license plate. And I went for build by license plate because they're already looking at my license plate. If I drive over the Golden Gate Bridge or the Bay Bridge or any of the others, they're looking at my license plate anyway. So why don't I just get billed for it? Which is back to the tension and the dilemma of it's really convenient. I mean, you know, it's really nice to not have to sit in a line before you go over a bridge or before you go through the tunnel. The cost of that is they know that you went through the tunnel. And that's an issue. And there are no rules about it. There's also other things where, for example, there was a Supreme Court decision a few years ago that said that it requires a warrant to get cell phone tower data, that, that you, your cell phone connects to various towers and they know approximately where you are based upon the signal strength between your phone and the tower. So, so you know, if you remember polar coordinates from, from geometry, you know, the signal strength is a proxy for distance and they know an angle. So they know about where you are and, that, and that's about 800 yards. It's just like remote viewing. Well, it's not just like remote viewing, but it's about 800 yards. I'll, I'll get to why that's not such a hot thing in a moment. But anyway, the Supreme Court said they can't get that without a warrant. Can they buy it without a warrant? That's the unresolved question. There is a lot of data that government, law enforcement, and others are forbidden to get without a warrant. And the important thing about a warrant to remember is probable cause. They have to have probable cause for a warrant. They can't just do it willy nilly. So, but if they have to get a warrant, but it's also available for sale, what's the rule? Well, I'm sure that you and I are saying they, they ought to have a warrant. They ought to need a warrant to buy the data that if they were to get it, they would need a warrant for. But there are other people with other opinions, including like law enforcement. You know, they want to just be able to buy it. They're going to say, well, if it's for sale to anybody, why can't I buy it? And the answer is because you're law enforcement. Yeah, but that's just... I mean, it's, it's, it's weird because, yeah, I understand like someone, can, it's a different, I guess, idea if someone buys something like that, because then that it's up to that person that is holding that you're going to sell it. I mean, they're going to sell it. If they don't know who you are, they don't care about your privacy or your data information if someone's willing to pay good money for it. Um, but also with law enforcement, that's like a loophole and the whole, like, if you need to get a warrant for it, now you're saying you can just buy it. I mean, if a normal person can buy it, what stops law enforcement It's saying, just it's because it's law enforcement i mean okay cop goes off duty is he doing it from his own personal thing or is he doing it from law enforcement still we cut law enforcement a lot of slack they do not deserve and we just do that we cut the government a lot of slack that they don't deserve i don't know if anybody remembers this and actually saw you write about this as well too vaccine passports that alone that could have been a very very dark route that we went and i mean I, I know you talked about some of the concerns with it on your um, um, EFF, uh, a couple articles that you had. Could, do you mind going into some of those as well, too? So I, just to make sure I don't get anything wrong. Sure. Um, this is also something that it's complex and there's a lot of issues here because, for example, the pandemic was and is an emergency. And and we all agree that in an emergency, we do things that we don't do in normal times. Now, of course, you're going to say, so what's the difference between an emergency and a normal times? And absolutely, that's where a lot of this comes in. Um, in the early days of the pandemic, before there was any idea when we were going to get vaccines or what they were doing, and we were all quite rightly afraid and just coping because this is the first time that human society has 
had a pandemic that was a deadly pandemic and that we had enough science and technological tools to understand a lot of what was going on in near real time. And by near real time, I'm going to say like months. Uh, because one of the things that people have said is, oh, you know, it's like coronavirus is caused about one third of all common colds, and they're not deadly. And, and COVID and these other coronaviruses will eventually will eventually evolve into something that is just like a common cold. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that is true. However, it took 40,000 years for the common cold to turn into no big deal from it killed a lot of people and a lot of people died. So this is like saying, well, in geological time, San Francisco is gonna be up near Seattle. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. 50 million years from now. Yeah, yeah, a lot of good that's going to. And this is one of those things that you have to switch the time scales on. So we didn't know what was going on. And there was a fear that there was going to be immunity passports because we have to have people doing essential jobs. You know, it's like, this was a sort of thing of, of, of how do you deal with this? And, and because this is the first pandemic where we have had this and we have done so well with modern medicine, there's an awful lot of things that are going on where people have no direct experience of things that went on in the relatively recent past. My, you know, my parents signed up for, and they stood in line for polio vaccines. Um, I'm too young to remember it, but I got them. Now they hardly do it at all anymore. You know, it's like, there's now chicken pox vaccines and I didn't get a chicken pox vaccine. And, you know, and that is a thing that lives in your nerves forever and comes back as shingles. So, People forgot about this stuff. We didn't want people saying, I'm going to get this deadly disease so that I can go work and maybe even make some more money. And so we were against that. We were also very much against vaccine passports. And this turns into, this turns into very subtle things because what we really didn't want was a surveillance system that we couldn't undo. Um, there are all sorts of things where we have an emergency, we put up emergency things to deal with it, and then we never take them down. Like, you're still taking off your shoes at the airport because one guy tried to hide a, hide a bomb in his shoes. You know, it's been nearly 20 years, and we're still taking off shoes at the airport because one guy tried to blow up a plane. And the discussion of whether or not we should stop is, oh, we could talk about this for two or three hours, all just that one issue. But, but that's the tension that we're talking about is that we don't want to create in an emergency a societal change that is, a, that is an appropriate response to the emergency that we can't turn off when the emergency is over. I mean, you know, it's like there's a fire, you turn on a fire alarm. When the fire is out, you stop the darn ringing bell. That's really easy to say, but there are all sorts of things where we just let the bell ring forever. Well, there's a large amount of people that will call it like conspiracy talk if you talk about the issues with the government. I mean, there's more social issues that people will accept, but when I talk about the government encroaches on their power once they're given more power, and an issue when it comes to the pandemic was you had a lot of people that had fears, and they needed to put their fears somewhere, and the government said, here, let me take your fears, and I'll take care of you, and the issue is, is that the line doesn't just stop. The goalpost keeps moving, and you have to be very, very cautious of that. And that's why when there's issues like even with mandates, I've linked mandates, the idea of that I wasn't, I was against it 100%. Um, I let people do whatever you want, whatever you want to say vaccine wise, I don't care. But the issue with mandates is you now get into a scenario like you have now, where people Roe versus Wade, 
I will make that jump. I will make that conclusion because it's 100% there. You allow people in positions of power to make metal, medical decisions for you, no matter if it was for good or bad. It doesn't matter that. But they don't just stop. They keep going with things. And that's what happens is that we need to understand, like, even the Roe versus Wade discussion, it's gotten turned into guys should just get a, a vasectomy. Now, if you're in a consenting relationship and family, you have two kids. Yeah, do, if you guys agree, get a vasectomy. But it, it's, it's now turned to where one side is now fighting the other side instead of looking at the people that took the right away in the first place. I mean, that's the real issue. People, I see Supreme Court trending or something like that, but I just go, you got to understand is that when you let one thing in, when someone tosses like what you would call a conspiracy and says, this is where it's going to go. Now, necessarily, is it going to go there? Maybe not. But also, you should be cautious of that because the thing about power is it's very, very corrupting. You should be careful of any sort of power, um, no matter where it goes. And one of the reasons that we have governments is to protect us from the whims of the powerful who can get away with it. And they can get away with, with all sorts of things. And that's part of what you want to have a government for, because if you don't have one, then it really is just might makes right. You know, the people who have the most power win. Um, and and that is, that is really both what we have government for and also what we have the idea of rights for. And presently we are dealing with the Dobbs Roe v. Wade repeal as a government attack on bodily autonomy. It's not just abortion, it's bodily autonomy. It's how much does the government get to say what you can do with your own body. And that's the real issue. Right now, since it's been basically one week, there's an awful lot of people who are angry, grieving, and lashing out in whatever direction and never confuse somebody's angry scream for a reasoned argument because we are both all capable of reasoned arguments and we are all really capable of angry screams. Um, a, and one of my issues with Twitter is that it is, it is an awful lot of what I call screaming at the television. You know, you hear something and you have a gut emotional reaction and you scream at the television and the actual words that you're saying don't really matter because what you're really doing is expressing an emotion and it's kind of like your pet meowing or barking except that we use words. So you say a bunch of words because that's what humans do is that we use words and Twitter has an awful lot of people saying angry things into the void. That's all it is. And there, are, there's also a lot of good stuff. I've seen some good, but like my news feed, I don't know if it's because of the P I try and follow like guests of the show and things of that, but everyone's like so political. That's why I try and be off my social media. I just, I just can't. It's like, I, I mean, kids my age that are like obsessed and I'm like, oh, my God, go eat a muffin and relax. I get it. There's issues to raise hell about. But just if you're posting like there was a person that made their account in uh, I think it was January. They had two hundred and sixteen thousand tweets. I've had my account for almost four years and I have a total of, I think, two thousand maybe. Yeah. Um, and I don't tweet a lot. And I also use a thing called semi femoral. Which you can set it up with a bunch of parameters and it will go and delete stuff. And I also have the, it automatically delete the vast majority of everything that I do because there are things that people said where, where, you know, remember an awful lot of this is both 
you said something in the heat of the moment or you said something snarky that out of context has has a a it, it it doesn't sound good i mean it's like i've had this problem where it's like i talked to a reporter and the clever thing that i said was a smart ass remark and taken out of context the smart ass remark loses the sarcasm that i had in it and people are legitimately angry because i said x and the correct thing to do is in fact to not say oh but that's out of context it's just apologize and move on um and well, also to curate smart. your feed that's smart you know somebody yelled at me because one of my colleagues tweeted about cryptocurrencies <laughs> a year ago in a way that 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 sounds really dumb in mid 2022 tweets don't age yeah. Well, we went and we deleted the tweet because they're absolutely right. The tweet did, in fact, age well. It was a perfectly fine tweet for February of 2020. It was not a good tweet for February of 2022. And so this, this is a part of, of the thing that we're dealing with is complex and we don't know about it. When when, 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 you know, when I was your age, <laughs> um, one of the slogans was kill your television. And a lot of punk culture and other things had as a recurring meme, kill your television. There were music videos where people would literally take sledgehammers to television. And the reason was what you were being fed in a stream of information that was highly biased towards favoring the powerful, whether they are the government, rich people, companies, etc., and them controlling the narrative. And so the comment was, you know, kill your television was take yourself out of it. And I quit watching television between my junior and senior year of high school, just absolutely cold turkey. Now, I will admit that one of the reasons was that D&D &D was far more interesting than what was on it television. Is. It is. But, 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 but I really did quit cold turkey. And, and I have not regularly watched any television since. Okay, fine. When Twin Peaks was out, you know, me and my friends got together and we watched it every week. And we did, in fact, watch um, a whole bunch of the X Files. And there were things where it's like the, there were a number of series that once the series was completed, bought all of the DVDs and watched them when I was traveling on airplanes. But that's not the same thing. You know, it's like, buying the entire series of, of a television thing and watching it without commercials is not the same thing as, as, as what we're really talking about because we're talking about, we're talking about the framing of the entertainment within a social context. And that's one of the things that we've gotten to change and we don't have a good handle on it. Um, and, and social media is indeed a huge problem. I think we just need a better ease of access to it. Not easier that you can access social media easier, but I think there needs to be like, are you sure you want to tweet this? Are you sure you want to do this? Like a lot of times, like people will type out a full comment or something on a video or something. And then right before, like I've done it before when I heard something, I was like, hang on a second. Da, 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 da. And then I, once I get to like the whole paragraphs done and I stop and I go before I hit click and send, like, let me just look at it. I'll get up and like go do something and come back. I don't feel like I need to tweet that. I don't feel like I need to put that there and I exit out. Once I started doing that, I started noticing my focus in social media, like even taking breaks off of it. I find it very, very hard to get riled up about things now. And I know so many people that like tweet a lot of things. And I go, if there was like a, a, a longer process, like you had to submit something and it would be actively like waiting to post. And I guess that delays information as well too. But it also gets into this aspect of, I guarantee you when you sit and wait on it, you don't like whatever you're about to put up and you regret it the next day to their credit 
they've started doing things like that. They've started putting up analysis tools that say, hey, do you really want to tweet that? But it's based upon things like intemperate language rather than something else. And this is an extraordinarily hard problem. And I'm, you know, I'm going to say, I think we're doing social media wrong. That's fair. Um, I, I, you know, I think that social media can be done right, but that the way that we are doing it is that it is designed in certain ways that are not necessarily good for everyone in all cases. Um, I well, we're set up in a business model and we're trying to think with personal um, intentions. And I think that's very, very complicated to do. All of our puzzle pieces aren't going to fit in the business model. So we, I th what do we adjust the businesses to our personal models or do we just understand the relationship that these devices are? They might be forms of communication, but they are also a service. They are also something much like a, a, a business is when you go to a Walmart or something like that. They are trying to sell you things. They are trying to show you things to get you to buy stuff. And we need to understand that. But I think a lot of people like they consider it on their phone and their phones in their pocket 24 seven most of the time, or they have it in their hand or something like that. And that's a very personal thing. Now it's in a form, it's like an attachment of you. And when you have those apps on your device, that now seems like, well, it's a part of my device and my device wouldn't treat me wrong. So like it's it's the best damn social experiment I've ever seen in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. In the very early days of Facebook, um, I was in a circle of people that included a number of the early founders. And these were people who genuinely believed that if we all live in glass houses, everything would be better. They, they, they came at this from a philosophical view that if you show your true self to people and to the world, that that will be a better thing than if we are all hidden off in our own little areas. And, and, you know, and that's what I characterize as if we all live in glass houses, it would be better off. And that reflected itself into the way that Facebook was set up, including things like the real names policy was that the whole idea was that was that we shouldn't we shouldn't be doing this. We should all expose everything. And I never agreed with it. And I think that, you know, um, it we know that that's a bad idea. So they have the problem of how do they cope with that? And Facebook itself it has the problem that Facebook is losing people all the time. From a sheer business standpoint, Facebook is a dying system. Yeah. It is losing people every day. For meta platforms of that company, the only bright spot on that is that about half of the people who are leaving Facebook are going to Instagram. That's still owned by Facebook. Yes. For them, that's the only bright spot is that they're bleeding users, but half the users they're bleeding are going to their other to their other thing. You know, it's like, you know, think of it as they had two nightclubs and this nightclub is no longer the cool place. And at least half of the, and you know, and half the people who think that that's no longer cool are going to your other nightclub. But it also means that, well, people are losing their faith in Instagram too. You know, Instagram has in its, policies and histories different it has a different model of the world like on instagram you're allowed to have an account for your cat you're not allowed to have an account for your cat on facebook because of the real names policy they want them to be real humans instagram is different well instagram is also at the point where it's it hasn't peaked but you can look at the usage curves and see that it's peaking that. And the company that owns them has to actually ask the question, okay, our first nightclub 
is losing people coming to it. Our second one is peaking. What do we do? Drop the real names policy. Well, no, that's why they're that's why they're going into 3D. <laughs> Jesus, man. What are we? T- that's in. Oh, my God. That's, that's the reason. That's crazy. That's the reason. Facebook is dying. Instagram is peaking. And that company will die and go broke. Well, it's going to be a shell they company. Have the next thing. It's going to be a shell company. It is oh, a shell company. I know, but who's going to buy it? And then who's going to take over Facebook while they switch over to Meta? I mean, I mean, similarly, look at look at 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 quote quote Google. John, the I like real, the way you think. The real dude. company. I like the, the real way you company think. is Alphabet, and Alphabet owns a bunch of companies underneath it. One of which is Google. I'm over here freaking losing my mind right now. I, I can't believe I did not see that before. That's crazy. So, so you wanted to get onto the onto the metaverse, and and in in my long and checkered career, um, in the early '90s, I was doing stuff with what we've called social virtual reality, and social virtual reality split into basically two things: one was social media, and the other was collaboration tools. And we moved to the collaboration tools because what we really wanted to do is we really wanted to create a really cool computer game that lots of people would play. But we also knew that our computer game was really good for doing things like conducting business meetings on. You know, it's like, you know, it's like talking to people over the internet. That's going to be big someday, right? <laughs> and and so we worked on that. And this was also when the internet was very new and there was no SSL. And lots of people told us, hey, I don't really want to share my private thoughts with other people when just like anybody could see them on this network. So that's what led me into doing cryptography was because I wanted to do collaboration tools and things like the metaverse. When we were doing our stuff, Snow Crash came out when we were in beta test and and me i was a security person and you know and and one of the conceits of snow crash is that it is a in, in their metaverse you could hand somebody something and the something would have malware in it and they end up with something like a pandemic happening except that the metaphor was far more like drug use rather than a disease but it was also a disease at the same time and that was, you know, that was one of the major plot points was this thing being transferred through the metaverse. And I, I had the opinion of, oh, my God, you know, the security people would never let that sort of thing happen. And actually, we got smart about that. You know, not everything, not everything runs when you, when you, when you download it. Um, but I also said, hey, actually, the user interactions are pretty cool. So I redid a bunch of things because I recognized that there were one, security problems, and two, there was usability stuff. And, and you have to have them both in place, is that you have to have both usability and security. So for I, I guess I would have to ask, what's the best way for people to understand? Like, do they just need to understand the relationship that they have with their devices isn't as personal as they think it is? I mean, like, because wrapping up here, like, what, what what would you give people tips on? I know people are concerned about privacy, but honestly, at the beginning of the show, I was more like, give me the privacy tips. But now I'm just like, honestly, it all makes sense now. Like the marketing aspect behind things. I mean, people being concerned about their privacy is, I I think is still a concern, but also I don't think it's the concern in the way that a lot of people view it. I don't think it's necessarily like, oh my God, what's Google going to do? Oh my God, is my phone going to be hacked? I think it's just the effect of like new things that get established. And when we talked about like the Roe v. Wade type situation, those are things that we can be concerned about. But when we let these marketing or these devices into our you know lives and we use these social media or these apps, we do understand the fact that we're not paying for this. This is something that they're going to find money somewhere. And what they find money in is going to be our information and our data. So I think better education, I think it just awakes people to the issue. And I don't think, knowing that people would really care anymore. I just, I I feel like people would be angry at first, but they get used to it. 
I think that one of the things to understand is the complexities of the situation. Every single one of these things that we hate has something in it that is good and is the reason that we did it. I mean, we both hate Facebook, but Facebook is a way where you can keep up with your old friends. You can know what's going on with your family and your cousins you never hear from. I've deleted 117 friends. What I started doing was whenever a birthday pops up, it says upcoming birthdays and it says today's this person's birthday. If I don't feel the need to wish them happy birthday, I delete them. I just, there's no point. Good, good, good. Because you're being mindful in the way that you're using it. But the thing that I'm talking about is that Facebook has a way to connect people to people they care about for free, no matter who you are, is in fact a good thing. Now, there's a whole bunch of bad stuff in there too, but let us not forget that the reason Facebook exists is because it is a thing that anyone can use for free. Google has a whole lot of stuff they're doing. They're the biggest ad company in the world. I mean, you know, 95% plus of their income comes from advertising and stuff around it. But their spread, but they're, you know, their search engine's pretty good and their email system's pretty good. And if you pay for it, they don't monetize your data. Um, Apple is after selling you devices. They want you to buy the next iPhone, but they also are pretty good on privacy. You know, it's like, you can either take this as good news or bad news. I mean, you know, the bad news is there's nobody better than them on privacy. (laughs) And they do an awful lot of really good things. I mean, for example, one of the things that they do that is relevant right now is that the health database that is on there that has your period tracking, your exercising, your heart rate, all of that is end-to-end encrypted, totally under your control, and only you have it. They, you know, they are handling that health data better than anybody else. But there's also all sorts of things of how they control the system and so on and so forth that we need to, to, to figure out what's going on. We have a world in which it's, you know, it's wonderful that if I want to go somewhere, you know, it's like there's a concert in town and I don't want to drive because I don't want to have to count how many beers I have that I can open up an app and a car will arrive at my front door and take me to the concert for about the same price as it would cost me to drive there in gasoline and pay for parking. It's like, that's really cool. However, they know every place that I took them. Also, before they incorporated driver's license, there was a whole slew of murders from random people signing up to be Uber drivers and driving people under bridges and killing them. Well, that's the reason that's the reason why taxis are highly regulated. Just walk, just walk, people get some exercise. Yeah, well, you know, um, um, that's not the answer either. (laughs) I'm so low tech and everything. Like, I think this is the most high tech equipment that I have is a microphone and a laptop that's about seven years out of date. Cool. Cool. I mean, you know, you're, you, you have, you know, you have a relationship with a bunch of this is similar to my relationship with, um, with television and movies where, you know, there's far more of it that I don't do than I do. And, and I think it's really good to be mindful and to understand what's going on. But part of what's understanding and going on is that absolutely, when people are offering you a service, they have to buy the servers, they have to pay electricity for the servers, and that money is coming from somewhere. And if you're not giving it to them, well, it's coming from somewhere. Where is it? In, in some cases, we have seen, you know, for example, Uber and others, you know, Uber got to be popular by intentionally subsidizing rides. They were losing, they were losing money on every ride. Actually, they might still be losing money on every ride. I don't keep up on, on, on their financials. But that's one of the things to pay attention to is to go and look at where is this company getting its money from? so that at least you understand it. 
And if a company is getting 90% of their money from advertising, then, well, you know. You know, you can make your decision other uh, one way or another. And, and you know, it's like I have been doing things like when I want a book now, 90% of the time, I order the book from a nearby independent bookstore that is a children's bookstore. It's one of the great children's bookstores in the world, about a mile from my house. And so, you know, my, my books on economics and policy and history and interesting fiction and stuff, I send to the children's book and I pay because, you know, they, they, they get the money for that. But, you know, there was a book that I saw and there was a $15 discount on a $30 book if I bought it from Amazon. And so, okay, for 15 bucks, I'll buy it from Amazon. It's financially smart. Well, we all make those decisions. I mean, I am very concerned about, for example, the way that our system to pay artists, particularly musicians, is utterly broken, has always been broken. And, and they usually get shafted and they get shafted by streaming services more than anybody else. So one of the ways that I do with that is that when somebody that I like comes out with an album, I go and buy the CD, even though I don't want it. And I go and I buy the signed CD. Or when I go to the concert, I buy some swag from them because they're getting no money from the music. I mean, you know, you know, this is like, you know, I want to pull my hair out about it, which is that musicians don't make money from doing music. They make, they get money from t-shirt sales. So when you say, oh my God, that t-shirt is 35 bucks. Well, that 35 buck t-shirt is a way to give the musicians some money. Buying the autographed CD, even though you're going to stream the music or even, you know, buying the vinyl because that's, that's more expensive is a way to give them money. And it's a way to give them money because everybody hates handouts. And, and it, you know, this is one of those mental things that humans do is that we all hate being dependent on other people, which is why this is an issue. So there's an awful lot of what we do where we buy and trade things where, where the real thing that is going on is that we have a social interaction and you are giving somebody money for something like you buy their CD from them at the concert, even though you, you're, you, you're probably going to stream it because that's a way for you to get money directly to them. And I make sure that I do those things. And those are the sorts of decisions that we all do where we have to figure out where we are on the world and what we're going to be doing with things. Well, John, I definitely got to get you back on the show, man, because you gave me some good food for thought in this um episode that we have um is there a place where people can find some of your links um i in, in the whole lack of social media etc i would say if you go to eff.org which is eff's website there's things that i've written there and others I will admit that I am really careless about collating everything that I have written and everything that I have done. And I am extraordinarily privileged and fortunate to say that if you Google me, you'll find stuff. Well, I'll make sure I put uh, some of your uh, links in there, even if you don't actively use your social media. And, and, and we, you know, we, uh, you know, I can point you to some things too. I mean, you know, we have email, we have texting. Yeah. You got my number. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure I, uh, I link, uh, the stuff that's not so private in the details below, but thank you, John, for joining me on this episode of out of the blank. Stay tuned for next episode.